building, that resentment of a very serious and threatening kind, building in the uh, officer corps because of Obama's stalling on the McChrystal demand for an escalation of 40,000 troops. This goes back to the way in which McChrystal was installed in power and his predecessor gotten rid of. So uh, at this point, we get the Naji Bulazazi case. Uh, Al-Qaeda comes to 33rd Avenue and Parsons Boulevard in Queens. But notice in that case, the imam there in Flushing, the FBI informant agent, was not charged. He can go home. Zazi stays in jail. How convenient for Obama with Afghanistan. Back in a minute. In regard to uh, what Phil Berg is doing in the uh, legal struggle to force Obama to disgorge a birth certificate or proof of qualification for the presidency, natural born and age 35, because that's not uh, immediately clear either more and more infantile all the time and therefore who knows how old this guy is there is progress uh, let me point in particular to uh, Camille Paglia a kind of uh, maverick academic feminist uh, and now we're at the edges of the uh, the liberal media cartel she uh, writes for salon.com and in a couple of articles and in a couple of radio broadcasts recently Camille Paglia has said that the question of the Obama birth certificate is a serious and uh, important issue, a real issue, that she has studied it, and there are indeed serious and uh, important questions about whether Obama has produced a birth certificate. Of course, he has not. He produced certification of live birth, which is a printout. It's like an attest that the document is somewhere, but it's not the original 1961 hospital birth certificate, which would be typed, which would have signatures in pen and ink, and about 40 to 50 points of information that are simply not on that certification of live birth that Obama has brought forward. So there is progress on this front. And again, remind people what a 1961 vintage birth certificate would look like. It does not look like a modern computer printout. Now let's do a case study, uh, as we referred to in the first hour, Iceland, as a case study of the workings of the world economic depression. Uh, Listeners know we followed the the collapse of the Icelandic crown in 2006-2007. This had to do with the uh, carry trade, hot money carry trade, in particular money coming out of Japan. You could borrow for 0% in Japan, and then you could take it to Turkey or Eastern Europe or uh, Iceland, among others, and you could get a much higher interest rate. And, of course, the problem was when that carry trade began to break down, and this occurred as the panic began in 2007 and then built into 2008. Uh, There was a collapse of the Icelandic currency, and this was complicated by the fact that three banks, Glitnir, Landsbanki, and Kaupting had opened branches, some of them had at least, in Britain and in the Netherlands and elsewhere under the uh, name of Ice Save, uh, high interest or somewhat higher interest savings accounts. Um, and it's not clear to me that there was any deposit guarantee on any of these. This was offshore banking and should have been obvious to anybody. Anyway, the British regulator did not come forward when these things opened and said, here, you've got to provide um, the uh, deposit insurance, that wouldn't be Thatcherism, would it? So when the crisis uh, began to explode after Northern Rock, when you had the Royal Bank of Scotland and indeed Lloyds Bank uh, in the process of going bankrupt and Gordon Brown coming forward with his hundreds of billions of pounds of bailouts for these companies and again with uh, Mervyn King and Alistair Darling attempting to do this beggar-your-neighbor policy playing the pound against the euro and the dollar, keeping interest rates higher in London, hoping that hot money would go to London and uh, that London would come out of it as the main center of international speculation and speculative finance. Uh, That didn't work. It blew up in their faces, as we pointed out at the time. They were too weak to do this, but they did a whole lot of damage in the process. This is an untold aspect of what happened a year ago. 
these three banks, uh, essentially, uh, there was a panic run on them, and the British regulator shut them down. And uh, at a certain point, Gordon Brown said, well, I'm going to compensate the, uh, the depositors of these banks. I'm going to say, uh, as a, just simply a matter of dictation, I'm going to impose that uh, you guys, you Icelanders, have to pay up to 100,000 pounds per account uh, and I'm going to reimburse the depositors, and I expect, the British government expects to get paid by Iceland. And they mobilized then all of the threats, threats from the IMF, threats from the European Union, threats from all kinds of international agencies, to try to lean on Iceland, a country of about 300,000 people in the middle of the North Atlantic there on that North Atlantic uh, volcanic uh, ridge been there for quite a while, right? The sagas and so forth coming from there. So the question then became this uh, demand by the British, joined by the Dutch, so let's call them the Anglo-Dutch, the British and the Dutch, that they wanted to have their governments paid off for money that the governments had gone ahead on their own initiative and without any binding commitment from Iceland at all, uh, to get to pay them back, right? Because they they had bailed out the depositors. Um, the demand from Gordon Brown at the beginning was to say the Icelanders have stolen twenty billion pounds of British money, and we're going to get it back. Now, bear in mind, Iceland has a GDP, and again, GDP is very misleading because that includes all kinds of financial froth, speculation, and so forth. The GDP of Iceland, eleven billion U.S. Dollars, and again, that's uh, 2007. So that's got a lot of speculative froth in it. Uh, the question now is uh, a lot of internal politics that we can't get into in too much detail here. But what's going to happen with this? The British and the Dutch, the Anglo-Dutch, are demanding big bucks from Iceland, and uh, you have a social democratic government in Iceland which says, "Well, we'd like to join the European Union now. Maybe that will help us." Beware the European Union. Learn the lessons of the rejection by the French and the Dutch of the European Constitution in 2005. The Irish have already rejected the Lisbon Treaty last year, 2008, and in uh, October 2nd, 2009, the Irish are going to vote again on whether they want to accept the Lisbon Treaty. Don't do it. Don't do it. The Irish have gotten as much as they can out of the European Union. They benefited from the European Regional Fund, but those days are gone. Now you got Barroso, the uh, Portuguese uh, right-wing extremist running the European Commission. He seems to want to have a dynasty there, the little Salazar, I guess we can call him, of the European Union. He wants to be renamed, and they're trying to bribe the Irish with kind of various kinds of last-minute um, aid packages, sort of a stimulus plan for Ireland. So the, the result is that after all of the blackmail by the British, the uh, Icelandic uh, parliament, the Althing, has said, look here, uh, we're going to offer you 2.7 billion uh, euros for the British and 1.3 billion euros for the Netherlands, so 4 billion euros, about 6 billion U.S. dollars. We're willing to give you 5.5% interest, but we are going to limit the payment to 6% of the growth of the GDP of Iceland in the future years, in particular between 2016 and 2024. Now, this I would submit is not a wise policy. It is not wise to admit in any fashion that these illegitimate blackmail demands, this attempt of extortion by the British and the Dutch, has any legal validity, any moral or political validity whatsoever. Iceland should, even though it's a small country, hang tough. The Icelanders were able to hang tough against the British in those cod wars in the 70s and 80s when the British in, insisted on coming and uh, fishing in what Iceland considered to be its own territorial waters. So the Icelanders were able to stand up to the Royal Navy. Uh, they can continue to do so. Don't offer to pay anything 
rather go for a debt moratorium. We'll be back with more about that in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Let me recommend once again go to tarpley.net and you will find uh, ways to buy the essential texts, the uh, Surviving the Cataclysm, Your Guide Through the Greatest Financial Crisis in Human History, Obama, the Postmodern Coup, The Making of a Manchurian Candidate, and Barack H. Obama, The Unauthorized Biography. That's your your trio of indispensable books to... Uh, take into the political struggles of late 2009 and into 2010. So the case of Iceland, this is a country that is um, being victimized by Gordon Brown, sort of in the way that the British under Chamberlain victimized Czechoslovakia, say, at the Munich conference of uh, September 1938, right, where the British uh, told the, uh, the Czechs, look, you're going to give these concessions to Germany, and uh, that's just the way it is, right? 